All right, hello, sir. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great today. Well, I can speak for both me and Ethan. We're very glad to have you on. This is Mr. William Barr. Um, yes. We're doing an interview with him today. Um, sir, like I said before, me and Ethan are very excited to have you on the podcast today. And uh, we start our show off with one particular question. Where did you grow up? I grew up on Snake Creek Road, very close to Sunnyside Store. And uh, I was there. Uh, I was out in Gladesboro, actually, the first five years of my life that I think about it. And then we moved to the house my dad is still in on Snake Creek Road. And um, I grew up there and graduated from Carroll County High School. Um, and then I left and went to uh, college from there. I went to private colleges, Virginia Intermont, which is now closed, in Bristol, Virginia. Mm -hmm at Davis and Elkins College up in Elkins, West Virginia. It's a Presbyterian-based college. So okay. I got a degree in uh, minor in philosophy and religion and uh, marketing, and then I went and got my MBA here in Florida. Right. Uh, and, uh, Were you very uh, academic in high school? Yes. Um, I, I, had these, I wasn't in the top 10. I was probably in the top 20. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed photography. I did photography for the 77, 76, 77, and 78 yearbooks. Uh, mainly the, the 77, 78, I did most of the pictures for that. Mm, okay. So you, were, you enjoyed photography? Yeah, I also did a radio show. I don't know if you have one going. It was through WHHV every Saturday. It was an hour long called Cowboy Classic. And uh, basically, people put their name on. It was couples that dated at the school. And uh, I played, at that time, it was like Hotel California, I remember, was a big biggie. But the hits uh, as that were requested, and I kind of picked at people because some of the guys switched so many girlfriends at times and things like mm -hmm. that. But I was uh, I was liked in school from what I knew. Didn't have any enemies and enjoyed my time there. Yeah, it's a great school. And we talked a little bit off the camera about you being active in school. What exactly did you mean by that? Did you mean like general physical? experience and or sports okay i was in the band um yeah. like i from hillsdale and immediate school when i was in ninth grade uh we joined we would come and march with the band at that time and colin barker was there in 75 mm -hmm. and then i was in the band in 76 and 77 and then when I went solely to the yearbook and so in my senior year, I had that three periods a day because I was also running the photography lab and developing, um, developing the pictures there. That was the first time that had ever been done uh, yeah. at that school. Yeah, my uh, one of my favorite teachers inherited that room, and he still has that closet where the where the pictures were developed, and he tells us stories about it because he uh, he also had that class. Oh, he just, I hope he doesn't tell all the stories. We we uh, uh, yeah, but for the most part, uh, I I spent a lot of time in the dark in there and printing pictures, and uh, I was. You know, I, I rode with the sports teams to take pictures. I um, was very active and because, when, you know, you have a lot of sports there. And I uh, covered all that. I covered the meetings. I also was uh, president of the photography club um, mm -hmm. at that at, as, as well. That pretty much all kept me busy. So it sounds like you were pretty involved in your book. Yeah. Nowadays, the yearbook class isn't very involved no. whatsoever. Really? Um, I'm so, sorry to hear that because it, it was a very popular class at, at the time that I was there. Yeah, nowadays, it's you, you go around and you, you take some pictures, but uh, an external company handles all, like, yeah. organizing it and everything. So I don't okay, think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And they're pretty thin too. They're not very in depth anymore. Yeah. 
Well, 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 if you're going to take a look at the 76, 77, and 78 yearbooks, I designed the cover on the 78 one, okay. which has the mountains on it. We just, I talked them into doing that in the color. But they're pretty thick. And we tried to cover as many students' pictures as we could uh, to try to get as many people in it. Uh, because uh, it, it's, it's easy to just take pictures of the popular kids, but my thing was to get everybody I could in there. And I hope that if you look at the 77, 78 yearbook, it has a good representative of, of, of all the students that were there those three years. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to look at it. So you graduate high school and you go to college for philosophy? I went for photography as what I went for Virginia and Lamont at that time was a college in Bristol that had a photography degree. And I went there and studied photography for two years. Uh, it was a liberal arts college and it was private school, which I really, really enjoyed. I uh, was elected to a lot of offices. I was president of the sophomore class. I uh, was very active and very popular through college. And then I went to a college called Davis and Elkins that is still uh, going up in Elkins, West Virginia. It's Presbyterian based, and that's where I finished up. And I did study religion and philosophy. I had a, a big interest in that. And then uh, marketing management was my degree. And uh, at that time, Senator Robert Byrd, who was uh, the Speaker of the Senate, uh, came to our school and actually taught political science there for a week. So that was exciting for me back in 1980. So looping back to your high school experience, you mentioned that Kylie Marker was there. I was in ninth grade at the intermediate school her last year, so I just was in the band, marching band, uh, and I wasn't directly with her. I did not know her personally, but she was a baton, you know, big with the, the, the front section, baton, all that. And then she won Miss America in 1979, and the whole town exploded. We had quite a welcome back and a parade, and it, uh, it was great. It was something to see. Yeah. Uh, what was the parade like? The parade was every sign in Hillsville welcomes Colleen Barker, and it was packed. I don't think I've ever seen that many people in town, even for a Christmas parade. The Miss America people kind of laid it out and brought her in, uh, as a coming home type thing, and she shows up in a big stretch limousine with a fur coat that's all the way to the bottom. And it, it was just remarkable because she ran up, and I remember Mabel Vass, she ran and hugged Mabel Vass and her teachers and everything. It, it was something big for us, really big. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. And speaking of teachers, uh, did you have any educators at Carroll County that um, really affected you personally? Um, who I just mentioned, Mava Bass, who I believe recently passed away, um, she was hard in English. She would give me D's with 20 minuses after them <laughs> on my papers, and I worked hard. And she said, save your papers, and in the end, I, I got to be in English. But you know what she had done? She used to work at Blacksburg. She had given me my first year of college so when I went to college and I took English I already had it done and I made A's in both my classes because of her so those D minuses were actually A's when I got to college that's she tricked me <laughs> that's good yeah lower stakes in high school than they are in college yeah. right yes Yes, but she was good, and uh, well, uh, but all my team, Jane Melton, who I had for math, who I think is uh, gone now, I think everyone pretty much that, Worth Cox for government, uh, we had some really excellent teachers back then uh, that I, I really appreciated. Yeah. yeah, and I've spoken with a, a few students at the high school from around when you went in. Was there a masonry class? Yes, uh, there was a masonry class. Uh, there was um, 
uh, an automobile class. There uh, was a design class that was sort of like architecture. Uh, uh, there was an engineering class. There uh, was where you fix hair, ladies' hair, uh, cosmetology. Uh, there was very active uh, wing teaching people uh, everything like that. And we also had in the 11th and 12th grade where you could come for three periods and then go to work. Yeah. And a lot of people who were not going to go on to college or just wanted to finish up high school or needed money that maybe support their families, whatever, would come and do government English and a special class, and then they'd leave at 11 and go to their local factories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have a similar program. We call it work release now. Okay. And you can get it during the day, first or last blocks, and you can leave. You can not be at school and you can work. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I think the biggest shock for me was when I first went to college, I had chosen a college that had um, horsemanship, ballet, photography, a lot of, of, of liberal art things. And one of the first people I met uh, was Jeff Rockland. And Jeff had an Oscar. Um, mm -hmm for a movie and uh, when he was five years old and uh, also I, I know you guys know about Avon bottles or you know something are you familiar with Avon bottles the different glass yes. bottles ask your parents about them I was in school with uh, one of the the CEOs of Avon that designed those at that time yeah yeah uh, Dr. Shibaga was the movie that Jeff had an Oscar from. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. 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 What made you decide to want to go to college? Because that's not something that was very common, especially at that time. And it's still not common nowadays for our area. Uh, to be very honest with you, I couldn't stand being inside a factory. I couldn't stand the thought of it. Um, I read a lot. I was a big reader. I still am. I've probably read 10,000 or more books. I don't know how many. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, expand myself. I wanted to be able to travel to get a, a decent job. I just wanted to, to expand myself beyond what Cal County offered at that time. Because all they had was Withrow Community College, pretty much, um, you know, that you could go to. Bradford was starting to come up as a school. And, of course, Blacksburg is there, which is an excellent school if you're interested in, in what they offer. But I was not interested in a big college. I wanted the small schools. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned reading. And me and Ethan are both really big into reading. Mm -hmm. Um, we love books. Uh, what books did you grow up with when you were an adolescent? Oh, what was, you was your big kidders? I think 1984 was one that really shocked me uh, when I first read it. Uh, as far as other, I'm blanking on you, and, and I may do that from time to time. I, I have a disease that makes me blank from time to time. Uh, but I like to read fictional books. I like to read westerns, but I like to read history. I worked in the library. Um, I had ADHD, I guess, but they didn't uh, call it that back when I was in Hillsville Elementary School. So because I finished all my work up so quick and everything, they stuck me in the library and on the fiction section, or not the fiction section, on the section that was about uh, say Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, all the historical uh, figures. I think there were like two or three hundred books there. I read all those when I was in the fourth grade. I read the entire rack. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I I was very interested in, in learning all I could. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, Luke and I are the same way. Sometimes it, the topics differ, but we're both very interested in learning as a whole. Yeah. You, you mentioned 1984. And yes, I, I read 1984 a few a few months ago. And have you read Animal Farm? Uh, yes, I've I've read that. Yes. Did you notice any similarities between the two books? 
Uh, well, they're both about the future, which I think we are in now. Um, that um, if you have a phone in your pocket, you are being followed, you're being watched. I could find everywhere you go. Uh, if you're on a computer, as you know, you can't delete anything. It's all backed up in, in what's called a cloud now. It used to be a network, but now it's cloud. Um, there's no way you can hide today. And there's a lot of people that haven't figured that out yet, but uh, I think they're going to wake up to the fact sooner or later. Uh, here, where I live, um, it really gets on my nerves because they have these signs like it says, don't go more than 45, um, uh, portable signs, speed signs, but in reality, they're cameras that are capturing your, uh, your uh, tag or your car. Mm. Uh, it would, it's, there's a lot of things being done that you don't realize today. Uh, if you have a phone in your pocket and you drive a car anywhere and you commit a crime, they can follow you down and find everything you've done. You mentioned cameras, and that's something our area doesn't really have to worry about. We don't have the infrastructure to provide mm -hmm. surveillance cameras on the populace. There is more than you realize in the police cars and um, yeah. the I don't know what you've got at the high school. Now, when I first saw cameras heavily was in 2000 or 99 when I went to England. I think England was the first country that I went to where there were cameras everywhere. You couldn't move without being on a camera. And that was mm -hmm. several 25 years ago. Yeah, there are cameras at the high school littered throughout the halls, but I don't think there are any in any classrooms. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you, like uh, my car, I've got a camera system that is forward, inside, and back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, my, car, my car has a backup camera. Okay. Um, I, down here, with the way people drive, if you don't have the whole system, you know, it'll catch everything that happens. If, and I have, I have a camera system that I had put in my car. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you use this for recording and not just parking or anything like that? It's, uh, it records the inside, uh, okay. the forward, going forward, um, the highway, and, of course, the back. And there is a backup camera that's separate, but this is recording everything around me. Okay. Uh, like uh, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, okay. some insurance were actually, uh, some insurance companies, and I don't know why I know this, but they will pay for your cameras because they can help prove that you weren't the cause of an accident. Yeah, of yes, yeah. that's that's the biggest reason I had this one put into my car. Um, it's completely a system in, and it, not only that, if you get hit by somebody who takes off, you've got all the information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's next neither here nor there. Neither here nor there. There. What did you do after college? After you got your I, MBA. Um, I um, I got that later. I got my MBA when I first got out of college. I was a manufacturer's rep. One of my roommates' father um, had owned a company called Vermont American, which is a cutting tool company like drill bits, they're still on the market if you go to Home Depot or a hardware store. Um, Vermont American uh, is a manufacturer. So I was a manufacturer's rep and I was traveling the state of Virginia to begin with and I sold hardware, automotive, and uh, it was wholesale. Like instead of, uh, for example, I, I rep bus fuses, which at that time were car fuses, and you think, well, you're not going to sell many of those. I sold tractor trailer loads up, is how I sold stuff. In other words, it was up to me to get the orders for the factory to keep factories running. I worked for Red Devil. Um, you, I don't know if you recognize them or not. They're a, a company that makes adhesives, things of that nature, 
And one of the companies I worked for, Clean Surface, which was a lubrication company, and like uh, if you're cutting metal, you have to put a lubricant on that uh, side to keep it from burning up, cutting oils and fluids, and they hired me directly after a year. So by age 24, I had a company car, a really good salary. I was making, it's hard to believe what is people are being paid today to start out because back in 1983 or 84, I had a $50,000 package by the time I was 24. And that's a lot of money back then. That would be equivalent to probably uh, 250000 today. Yeah. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. No. You mentioned selling. Did you receive a commission on that, or was that kind of like a commission? It was commissioned. Like, um, uh, how to explain it? The Southern States still in business there. Yeah, there. I used to sell to them, and when I would go to Richmond to talk to their buyers, then I would be. They would be buying for all three hundred stores at one time and say I sold these blue tarps which you see all over the place at that time they were fairly new so let's say I sold a truckload of them and they were twenty thousand dollars then I would get between five and ten percent commission off of that wow okay so that's a okay. substantial amount yeah. yeah so if you worked hard and you, you built your accounts up you can really really do well did you yes. find that stressful at all uh, yeah, it was a lot of loneliness, a lot of stress being on the road all the time. But on the other hand, the money was really good, and uh, I was able to buy my first house by age 25 south wow. of Charlotte, North Carolina. I bought an 1880s plantation house, which um, I spent the next three years of my spare time redoing. And then I fixed it up and sold it and then moved to Florida. Mm -hmm. So. And what, what motivated you to move to the Charlotte area? Yeah. Uh, that's where my job put me when I became vice president of the lubrication company. They wanted me based in Charlotte, and that's how I ended up there. And then I got married around age uh, uh, 25 and had my first child. Okay. Did you still stick with the company when you moved to Florida? I uh, know. When I moved to Florida, I uh, at first was in insurance, and then after that, uh, I started in computer science in the early 90s with SAP. Are you familiar with SAP, SAP? I'm not. Okay. Uh, SAP is like Oracle. It, it runs a whole factory, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, say, for example, you have BMW in Spartanburg, South Carolina. SAP, would, it has modules. It's a German company. It's out of uh, Germany. And um, my business partner uh, is a major programmer in SAP. As a matter of fact, uh, in the late 80s, he was in Saudi Arabia programming mm -hmm. SAP. At that time, SAP paid very, very well, three to five hundred dollars an hour, which was unheard of money back in the late eighties. Money now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, um, if you were really good at it, like my business partner was, um, you had all the work you could take because factories run on SAP. SAP. Uh, tells the factory what they need to order, how to run it, how everything works. It's an, it's incredible what it does. Is it kind of like Cobalt? Uh, cobalt would be a very small section of it. It's okay. it's a language on its own. It's, it's the only way I know to explain it. How we ended up with our company, that we ended up traveling, is my uh, business partner that I went into and formed the company um, came up with a link, a document link. And at that time, document software was big. Like uh, yeah. a big factory might have invoices coming in, and they may have 10000 an hour or something like that, say at Ford or Mercedes-Benz. 
and my partner wrote a link that linked document software into SAP. And that link is what we ended up going around the world to sell starting in the 1990s. Okay. And we've talked to you a little bit before this, and you've told us that you've told us about your world travels. Is this how you got involved with going around the world? And uh, yeah, no, this is how we got started is um, SAP accounts are, they're big accounts, but you can't live off of just what was in the United States. The accounts were worldwide. They were in South Africa, a gold mine. Uh, they were in Chile, which was copper mined. Uh, we had the world's largest nickel mine in Perth, Australia. We had a university uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, it was varied accounts. We had Mercedes-Benz in Germany uh, and Stuttgart. Um, we, we gave a lot of presentations, and, and then we did installs and temporary installs and trial installs. And that's how we started traveling. But not all my travels were business. Some were business, some were pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned... You mentioned your travels, and you sent us a list of yes, all the places you had been. Yes. Are there any that you want to talk about specifically before we started asking? Um, you know, I, I'm, I just want to tell you this. I come from a family on my mother's side where they used to tell me growing up they moved so much and they traveled so much that the chickens would actually lay down and put their feet in the air when they saw them coming because they were moving again, Okay. I come from a family on my mom's side, and a lot of my relatives are from Florida. I didn't just move here out of the blue. I, I used to come to Florida as a young man and teenager and work on the cattle ranch down here. But uh, I've always wanted to travel and loved to travel, so when I was able to put together Dino Morris Corporation with Mike, uh, it was a perfect match, and I did the sales, and he did the installs, and, um, you know, we were in business uh, for about 16 years with that company. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And um, we skipped over this a little bit earlier, but when you became vice president with your company in Charlotte, mm -hmm. what do you what was that more executive managerial role like? Did you enjoy it? Um, it was more of a title than uh, I was still in heavy sales, but the reason okay. they did that is they made me a regional vice president, and it was more of a title than anything to make me look a little bit more important than what I was, to be honest with you. <laughs> Okay, it's easier to get through the door if you have a card that says regional vice president than sales, okay? Yeah, and you have to get by that secretary back then. <laughs> Did you ever have a desire to move into a more managerial or executive role? Um, yeah, I would take anything, and that's what happened when I met Mike, and then we uh, formed Dana Morse Corporation, and so I ended up you know, and and uh, we we really had quite a ride uh, with that company. So, what was your big, your first big foreign trip with your company? You and Mike. Okay, the first trip that I took was Italy. Uh, that was kind of uh, we had Fiat and uh, Turin, Italy, and North Italy. Uh, and we also had accounts uh, at that time in Florence and uh, Rome, outside of Rome. So we travel a little differently from a lot of people. We don't get a travel agent and have everything booked. We're the type that buy a plane ticket, get our credit American Express, and here we go. And, uh, you know, you land, I remember landing in Rome, uh, our first trip, we made it uh, during Christmas season, it was, uh, it was during December, it just happened to come during that time, and uh, we didn't have a hotel reservation, we didn't know where we were going to stay, we didn't know, we knew what the accounts we were going to see, so we went to the train station, um, from the airport we took a train in, to Rome, and there are people at the train station who uh, 
sell or buy your hotel rooms. And we got a hotel room like that, and uh, from there we found our account, let them know that we were there, we visited our account, and then on weekends and evenings we toured along. So how long did you stay in Italy for? That trip was about three, three and a half to four weeks. And oh, wow. Wow. We covered Rome, we covered, um, let me get my notes here. Um, I don't know if you guys looked at my Facebook page. Did you see my, I put up uh, um, Michelangelo's David? Uh, yes, I did see that. Yeah. Okay, I put that up after a school in Florida uh, banded. I, I was beyond the weight of what I was hearing and seeing, uh, and I live in Florida, but, um, you know, I, I spent an entire day, uh, we did, in, in Michelangelo's studio in Florence, looking at David and, and other statues that he had done, on top of, in the Vatican, you know, the 16th chapel, which he, he painted, um, if it were up to the people in this country, the way they're, they're going with this fascism, they would, I don't understand. In Rome and Italy, nudity is not a big deal at all. And uh, this is just the culture. Yeah, it's not in a lot of, the, in a lot of countries, no. but it is here. And... It's, it's a very big, it's a cultural, a cultural thing. Um, I mean... Hold on here. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, I made some notes on that particular trip because we went several other times. But this trip I really enjoyed. I do remember uh, about two and a half weeks in, it was Christmas Day, and we had been to the Vatican the night before, and we had saw uh, Pope John Paul do the okay. Christmas. Okay. Okay. Um, that was very moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm not Catholic, but um, it was, to me, it was it was very moving. Uh, something that, that else that I noticed that I just want to say is they, they don't decorate uh, in Europe and all these countries like we do. They don't have Christmas trees everywhere. They don't have their cell signs. They don't have all this crap. Christmas is about one thing, and when they do have a manger scene, there's no baby Jesus until Christmas Day. He hasn't been born yet, and that is something that I, I noticed when I was there. Um, some of the things that, for that trip, for me, coming from Cal County, you know, let me look at this. I, I can't really tell you what was there was so much the Coliseum uh, yeah, the, yeah. the Spanish stairs um, supposedly the stairs that Jesus climbed with his cross were stolen or moved in the 4th century AD to Rome and you climb those stairs on your knees and you can see blood through little glass areas and those are supposedly the stairs that Jesus climbed with his cross to Pontius Pilate's house when he was um, uh, convicted. And I did climb those uh, on my knees. Uh, also very moving. Um, the Pantheon, if you're familiar with that, uh, yeah. uh, quite, quite uh, something to see. Trevi Fountain, the Roman Forum. Uh, the jail where Paul was held and wrote Corinthians and wrote Romans, um, you know, um, things that I've heard of all my life. Um, the Christian catacombs where the Christians hit out. And the, the, a big thing that is, is a misconception is that there's Christians and Catholics now. And the, in the world, there's Christians. Catholics consider themselves Christians. When you're in Europe, it's Christians. There is no separate uh, on that. And I'm sure that's arguable uh, in Cal County, but it, it is how it is. Yeah, um, I found that to be a very American concept, the idea that Catholics and Christians are not the same. There's a lot of concepts that are very American that uh, 
you run into that once you go around the world, you, you start learning that, first of all, uh, how do I put this? I was brought up being told that we are special, that God put us here in the U.S., and that we are special people. Um, I, I don't know how I want to say this and that we're blessed to be here in the U.S. But I, I've learned after going to around 60 countries, no, we're no different than anyone else in the world. Yeah. Jesus, uh, God, put us all on this earth, and there isn't a, a, a right or this or that that is, and this is my opinion, there's many people who argue with me, uh, I think that, People tend to think their country is the best and this and that, but that's not how the world is. We're all one people, you know. Yeah. We're all we're all one people. Uh, we did go to Florence, and as I, I said, with, where Michelangelo's studio was, and, and the statue of David, um, and then we took a side trip to Pisa. For the Leaning Tower of Pisa, um, yeah. that was that was really great. And then we spent New Year's in Venice, which was cold as it is to be. Yeah, bet. Okay. But uh, we were in St. Mark's Square uh, when New Year's rang in that year, and that was that was quite quite a trip there. And then we went across to Turin to Fiat Motors after that, uh, which was our account. That we were there for. Did you see any of the uh, Ita the Italian Alps while you were there? Uh, yes, we rode the train. Well, we took several trips to Europe, and where we took uh, employees because yeah. we would we would go to different distributors that we were getting to distribute our software, and say we had a you're in Milan and GE wants um, an install to try out our software. Well, Milan is just below the Italian Alps, and Venice is near the Italian Alps. But we took a train around Europe, and I'll tell you, that was one of the most moving things of my life. From 1998 to 2004, many times we would just ride the rails through Europe, from Germany, Switzerland, uh, to Denmark, uh, and what I would do is I would go and hang off the last car, uh, and I s just look at these little towns with the snow on them, and it it was just it was just like being in another world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Italy, how does the cuisine and the food compare <laughs> to our American version? Okay, um, first of all, you don't go out to eat till about 9 o'clock or later yeah. at night. And secondly, you never eat pasta with your main meal. Uh, you would start out, uh, your, your meal is going to be two to three hours in the evening. And you're going to start out with uh, anna pasta or, or some type of salad or something like that which from there you will then go to the pasta. Uh, and uh, from there, then you would go into your uh, main dish, uh, you know, what, whatever you've ordered. And then, of course, into your dessert and a lot of wine. And I'm not a big drinker, so I sipped, but uh, the Europeans do drink quite a lot of wine. Mm -hmm. and, so they don't have the alcohol problem we have. And like when I was there in Spain in 2002 with my children, and when I take my children to Europe, they were served wine at many restaurants at ages 10 and 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. One glass. Yeah. Is that something that you let them consume? Yeah, I haven't had a problem with it. If they wanted to try it, they didn't like it too much. <laughs> But uh, again, it's a total different outlook on on drinking from what we have in the U.S. They do not drink wine to get drunk. Wine is drunk as a food, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. 
Have so, you ever been to Bratislava? To where? Bratislava. It's, a, it's the capital of Slovakia. No. No. Sorry. I have a, I have a friend from Bratislava, and uh, he, he says the... Uh, the wine culture there is very, it's very strong, and I, I don't know how it compares to maybe Italy or Germany mm-hmm. or other other European countries, but I, I tend to believe them. <laughs> yeah, it, it probably is the same all over Europe, and that uh, uh, they they do not look at it as first of all, there's nothing wrong with drinking wine religiously in all these countries, and secondly, it people don't get drunk on it. They only have a glass or two and then move on. Now, um, also in Italy and Germany, you you start out in the mornings, you have breakfast, you work, uh, and you have a pretty heavy lunch, maybe a little wine, and then everything shuts down, or it used to back then, shuts down around 2 till 6 o'clock, and then you go back and work two or three more hours and then you have your meal starting around nine to to twelve and the beer in germany was that as big a deal as we think it is in america or Mm, uh well i was never there for i was there for one festival in uh mints but um no I, i mean it's it's not like it is here. You don't see people just getting drunk off their, their butt and where they're stumbling around and everything. I'm not a drinker, um, so I, I tried the beers there. They're very heavy. They're very thick. You know, um, beers here um, basically are like, um, what do they call them? Um, I don't want to say that word. Urine water. <laughs> They're very, they're very uh, weak compared to the beers there. The beers there are very dark. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Um, and in your list, you mentioned Germany, and there's a really interesting part here. You talk about Bremen and the Nazi naval home. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, we, we actually um, set up an office outside of uh, Berlin, and meant mm-hmm. Germany, where we had uh, for about three years. And uh, the naval home I went to was where the head of the Nazi Navy, uh, that was his home, and that was our attorney's house. And uh, we went there uh, to see our attorneys to help set up our company, and uh, that was the house that he lived in uh, up in, in uh, was up on the water trying to see here uh that's how come i had that that down that was something that was uh, you know one of those things you run into that uh hold on here a second okay yeah because in germany i we pretty much covered germany from one end to the other with by train by rail uh, with accounts, we had accounts in Berlin. We had accounts in Stuttgart. We had Mercedes Benz. That was their headquarters then, before they were bought out by Chrysler. Uh, Mainz, uh, M A I N Z, the Gutenberg printing press was uh, vented there, and we happened to be there the weekend that they had that festival. Uh, that was in February or March. And all the school children, every class, they had a parade that must have went on for four to six hours. And the big thing that I, I learned a lot about the Gutenberg Press, but I also learned a lot, you know, in, in your area, the King James Bible, Zit, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the first Bible that was printed is the Gutenberg Bible, not the King James and uh, a lot of people would argue that, but that's just simple truth. And that was in the 1400s before King James was even written. Now, and also in Germany, um, I don't know if this was with my children, but uh, I went to Dahar, D-A-C-H-A-U, Dahar. 
It's a concentration camp outside of Munich. Now, this was opened in 1933, and the United States didn't know this camp was open until probably 1940. Uh, they snuck it in, and they opened it, and uh, I did tour that with my children. Uh, it was it was hard. Uh, it, for me, was personal, and I think you know why. Uh, but the really hard part, and to this day, I don't have one in my pocket right now. I picked up stones there. They would make prisoners take these huge boulders and beat them down to little rocks just to have stuff to do till they fell over dead. And I picked up a few of the rocks and I, I carry one in my pocket from time to time uh, just to remind me what happened in the Holocaust and how bad things can be. And um, I'm very frightened, especially I'm in Florida now, I'm seeing book banning I'm seeing things go on that I saw and have learned about in Germany. And it's up to your generation and the ones of us to speak up. We cannot sit back and let this happen. Yes. Uh, to, speak, to speak on that, in Germany, how is Nazi history handled? Yeah. How do they talk about it or do they talk about it? Um, uh, this is how they talk about it. When I first got to Munich with my children and I wanted to go to Dahar, I asked the uh, lady at the hotel how to get there, and she got down on her knees to my children and, she, and tried to tell them they would rather go see a movie uh, production place where they made Chitty Chitty Dang Dang. And my little girl and my daughter said, no, I want to see the concentration camp. They don't like to talk about it. Um, Nazi symbols are outlawed. Any Nazism is outlawed. Um, the camps are hard to find. Oh, I thought they were, but I did find it, and I went through it. But they try to ignore it as if it didn't happen. A lot of them do. I saw a picture of uh, someone in Germany doing a Nazi salute, and then the next picture uh, was them being tackled by a SWAT team. Yeah, that's against the law. Uh, but unfortunately, it, it's happening in this, com this country. Uh, we've had people for DeSantis at Disney uh, with Nazi uh, symbols and doing Nazi salutes. Uh, as we, you know, we have got to stop this dictatorship and this, this we're losing our democracy. Uh, and I, I really, really after going and seeing so much in Germany, it, it's, you know, I'm sorry, but I've never seen a child get shot by a, a book that had some sex in it. Uh, I've never seen a child die from a book like that. I think people are way overreacting to very little minor things. And also, picking on people who are different, who can't fight back, like trans trans uh, people and people like that. If it doesn't affect your life, it's none of your business, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Completely none of your business. Yeah. And I, I think that um, because a certain political party in this country has nothing else to offer, that's the only way that they, they know to go. And, uh, you know, it's easy to pick on the guy that can't fight back very easy. Now, are the concentration camps in Germany run by the German government? Uh, no, they're run by the Jewish, uh, uh, the people who uh, had relatives in the camp, uh, okay. and they were preserved through the Holocaust. Uh, we, I was going to say, we met, and I have a picture of him, I met a guy who claimed he was 85. Um, at that time, it was five francs. I took a picture of him with my daughters, who claimed he ran the ovens there at Dahar. And uh, he told us about bringing the bodies or the, the people in and, and uh, the, making them take everything off. He showed us the gas rooms. And he said he worked there. Uh, I don't know if he did or not. His age did, did uh, match. He wanted five francs for a picture. I gave him the money for the picture, and we got away from him. He was giving me the creeps pretty bad. Yeah, 
So. Yeah, I think I would be part of and try to advertise, really. Yeah, well, um, I just think that uh, America needs to look at history, and we need to see that. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, uh, I've got children that are now grown, but there is nothing of any book that I would have ever taken away from my children to read. And in this day and age, um, when you ban a book, all you do is get everybody to hunt it down and go read it. It's called the Streisand effect. Yeah. 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 Something else you had also mentioned is your travels in England and you witnessing the changing of the guards at Buckingham Palace. Yeah, what was that like? Okay, and England, England is is cold and wet, first of all. It's <laughs> not a real sunny country, but uh, there's a few things there on that trip that were really, really great. Uh, the changing of the guard is, is something that everyone should see if you're, if you're there. It's, it's like it is on TV. It's, it's a really nice ceremony that uh, you can get a lot of pictures. The guards themselves, my daughter's played with one trying to get him to move. She couldn't get him to blink. They couldn't get him to do anything. These people are very, very uh, um, well-trained. Um, yeah. We also... I don't know if you noticed there, we went to Kensington Palace and we toured Princess Diana's apartments or her rooms where she lived. And one of the big things that I did with my children is they have an orangery, they call it there, which is like a greenhouse. And this is where Diana went with her children uh, to have her meals and everything. And I had tea in that with my daughters, at a three o'clock tea where you have scones and, and clotted butter and all the, the British uh, um, tea. Um, another thing um, we did that, and I this also comes back to Mexico, but um, Stonehenge. I was there yeah, for the yeah. summer solstice, okay? And it, it's remarkable, the, the summer solstice at Stonehenge, I don't know if you know how that works, but the rocks are such that there's a hole, uh, it's a triangle, and when the summer solstice for uh, the first day of summer comes up, and for each season it goes around, the sun goes right through that, the middle of that hole. It goes through the middle of that rock. It's lined up. I saw the same thing in Mexico uh, at a um, pyramid for the winter solstice uh, a few years later. But it's just remarkable to see that, and we were there for that. We also went to Stratford upon Avon, which is where Shakespeare was was born, and we had uh, we went to Oxford. We had a tour guide who was an Oxford professor, and he did tours in the summer. And it was a pretty good drive out to, to uh, Stratford upon Avon. And coming back was probably a couple hours, you know, coming back in the bus. And he recited from memory Shakespeare and sonnets. And uh, it was remarkable to to ride across the English countryside and hear that. And uh, it's also, I don't know if you've heard, but Shakespeare has been banned in some schools in Florida. Really? I didn't yes. Know that. Yes, and it's up to your generation to fight this and fight it hard. I think that's not enough. Yeah. Certain psychology classes have been banned, like AP psychology and yeah. certain so schools. The news, yes, the the ignorance and the dumb and down is exactly what Hitler did. He got rid of the books. He got rid of the professors. He dumbed everybody down. And when you dumb people down and they don't know what's going on, then you can take over. Um, you have a YouTube channel, and in one of your videos, when you were in England, you visited the Roman bathhouses in Bath. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Okay, yeah, that was part of Rome, and um, we also saw the same, uh, I'm, in that video, it shows the the Roman baths that were built there back, this would have been around the time of Christ, 
that these were put in. And also the aqueducts, I, I, I can't remember that film. Does it show the aqueducts coming in with the, with the waterways? You know, the Romans built roads and aqueducts and and they actually had baths, public baths, and uh, that's why well, they call it bath. But I'm thinking this was built around 200 years before Christ uh, in this particular area. And then also when you travel around Europe in Spain, I ran into the same aqueducts uh, that I saw in, in England. Uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, most people don't realize that the Roman history in Britain... It started out as uh, Britannanum. Britain. Yeah. The Romans well, it, were there it's, before anybody. It's so very it's heavy. Yeah. It's very heavy. Rome and Rome, uh, you know, they built roads. They 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 had quite. Um, they were very advanced, and I think they're a good lesson that this country needs to look at. They were very advanced, and then they went. They fell flat on their face. Uh, yeah. Speaking of that, and I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier, do you see some of the same architecture and agent infrastructure around Europe because of the Romans? Yes, yeah. Uh, that's what I was talking about, the aqueducts. You yeah. see the same ones in Spain. You see the same ones in Italy. You see the same ones in Switzerland. You see the same ones in Germany. Uh, the Roman Empire was really big. I, I can't imagine how, at that time, you know, the average person only lived in their 20s, how they were able to, to do everything that they did. But it, it's remarkable. It's very remarkable. And there's a lot of stuff that's also not true. Like the Colosseum, I bet you've heard they fed Christians to the lions. Never happened. It did happen in something called the circus. A few hundred uh, at a at a different time, but there were no Christians that were fed to the lions. There's a lot of things that are not true that you hear in this country. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, that goes for anything, though, you know. Yeah, yeah, and things like that. Um, I'm gonna hit like France. Um, what we did do trains. If you ever go. Uh, to Europe, and I haven't done this in other countries, but I would recommend you take sleeper cars with the trains because yeah. I was in, in, in uh, France with my children. I've been there for business before, but when I took my children there, I wanted to go from France to Munich, and so um, after we had toured France and uh, everything, we were able to get a sleeper car overnight that crossed through Switzerland and, and, and into Germany, and then the next morning we were in Munich ready to go. I also mentioned uh, something that happened to me in Munich. My daughters were, how were they at that time, 10 and 14, and we were waiting on a car or a train to Austria, and we had finished up for the day in the hotel. I, I left the luggage, and we, we didn't have anything to do for a couple hours. So they sent me to the playground over near the college with the kids. And there was a bridge to cross uh, to get there. Uh, I didn't think much of it. And we're going across the bridge, and my oldest daughter goes, Dad, look around. There's no... And I looked around. There were literally hundreds of people with no clothes on bathing in the sun. Okay? <laughs> and I was like... Yes, they're all out having a nice suntan today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, if that happened, and, and we have new beach, beaches here in Florida. I don't know why our governor acts the way he does. We have four Trump Towers below me down here that just happen to have the biggest new beach that Miami has is a Trump Tower. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> Did you go to any beaches in the, the south of France? No, I've not been to any beaches in Europe. I've been to beaches in, in Australia, uh, but not Europe, no. No. 
Speaking of France, we saw uh, you mentioned Leonardo da Vinci. I'm, me and Ethan are both very inter interested in him. Can you talk about that a little bit in your time uh, in Paris? Well, of course, the Louvre, you know, the, the Louvre uh, Museum and uh, the Mona Lisa. Uh, and Leonardo da Vinci uh, has a lot of artwork in there. And it, now, the Cathedral of Notre Dame had not caught on fire when I was there, so that was very nice, yeah. great yeah. tour. And um, other countries that we went through, Switzerland, beautiful, beautiful, uh, and all the Swiss Alps um, and, and going through. Denmark, we had an account with the power company outside of Copenhagen, the Little Mermaid statue was in Copenhagen. That's where Denmark. Uh, the the train went across the North Sea uh, on a ferry, and they had something I saw in Germany, and this was in 2000 in northern Germany. They had windmills as far as the eye could see. They were doing great power 25 years ago, and we're still fighting about it in this country. It's really sad. Uh, Sweden, Finland, we had uh, accounts. Austria, I'm going to cover that because I want to get into to, uh, Asia and some other places. Austria, yeah. we went to Salzburg. I took the children up to the field with the sound of music. You see them dancing in. Yeah. Um, we got there late yeah. that evening, and I ordered room service, thinking, okay, we're just getting basic room service. And uh, the way it was served, each each item we ordered was on a separate plate. So they brought like three, I uh, ordered three items per person. So I got nine plates on three different carts. The room was full of food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, did you ever go to the uh, the ne the Netherlands and Amsterdam in that area? Uh, yes, uh, Mike is Dutch. And his family migrated from Holland. And we had an account there at the university. It uh, was one of our accounts in Holland. And uh, we, uh, we went to Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a pretty wild town. Uh, pot, or not pot, marijuana was legal back in uh, the time we were there. And you go to a coffee shop. And I had six employees with me. It was kind of funny. So I've got six employees with me, and they're all in their 20s and 30s, and we're in Amsterdam, and they're looking at me, and I know what they're going to say. I said, look, when we Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> you know, come on, guys. I'm not going to inspire you if you go to a coffee shop. No. <laughs> so, you, you know, you have to realize that, that things are different. But, yes, we, uh, we went. We went. Uh, to Holland, I remember driving or going to an account in the snow. I thought this sales, this guy was going to kill us. We were in a big BMW, and it was about a foot of snow on. It was just coming down, and he was not slowing down at all. Mm -hmm. You know, you get into some interesting things like that. Um, you did ask about Nazis. Now, in Austria, there's a castle up in Salzburg on the hill. And we went up there to eat, and then it said there was a World War II museum in the top of that. So I took the kids in it, and it was a Nazi museum. Austria has not outlawed the Nazi party. And they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, okay, girls, I think we've seen enough. Uh, it was, it was not, not comfortable, I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, we did enjoy uh, Salzburg in that um, Mozart was from there. We went to his home, and, uh, you know, it, it was, again, we took a train to Berlin where we slept overnight and went, in, went into there. Now, uh, time. Okay. Uh, Eastern Europe like Russia, St. Petersburg, Moscow. We didn't really do much sightseeing there. That was all business. That's why I didn't have much to do. 
Um, I'd like to cover going to what we did get at one point. Okay. Yeah, what happened was we had uh, we already had an account in Australia, and Australia was it's a 16 hour flight from Los Angeles, and the 16 hours on a plane, I'll tell you. So um, we what we did uh, is one of um, we found that British Airlines at that time offered an around the world ticket in business class, and it was thirty five hundred dollars, and you could stop at each continent, the three different places. Okay, and you, what you did as at that time I was near Tampa and Clearwater, so you had to fly west until you finally came back around the world. So we bought around the world tickets, and we left Tampa, flew to LA, where we uh, took Qantas to uh, Sydney, uh, and we had an account in Sydney, and uh, we toured around Sydney, went to the Opera House, and uh, I'm going to kind of skip Sydney, and then Australia is such a big country that uh, it's another six hour flight from Sydney across the country to Perth on the other side. We had the world's largest nickel mine, Western Mining Company, outside of Perth was one of our accounts. And the reason I jumped to Perth is we took, um, we had an account lady there who we were working with who had a surprise for us. We had to get up early one morning. And she took us over to a park where we were handed koala bears. It was feeding time. Okay? So koala bears are not the cute little curly animals you think they are. They can get a little nasty. So as long as you keep the food coming, they're okay and they don't bite you. But we had a great time. I spent uh, probably an hour with the koala bears that morning. Uh, and then from there, we did an outback tour um, which was pretty rough. You couldn't get out a lot because of the different snakes, poisonous spiders, all the different things that are in the outback of Australia. But it was beautiful. It was in uh, it was in the south of Australia, and I remember we topped a hill, and then the ocean, the southern ocean, uh, the beaches and stuff just went on forever. It was just. It was really breathtaking. And you know the big white birds, cockatiels that some people have for pets? Okay, those flew over like and like crows fly over hills for. Uh, it was just, if there was anywhere in the world I could live, I could live in, in Perth, Australia. It, it is just what, absolutely beautiful. What was the climate like in Australia? Was it really hot? or was Okay, it well, you have to remember you cross the equator. So yeah. everything's flipped. So when we got there in, uh, let's see, when did I go the first time? I guess we went several times. We got there in March and April. Uh, they were going into fall of the year. And uh, it's according to where you're at. In Australia, it can be just like Hillsville in certain parts with snow. Wow. And, yeah, wow. in the northern parts. And uh, it's cooler in the southern parts. But uh, the thing that, that was my first time on the other side of the equator. I've done it a lot now. But it's very confusing at first to realize that uh, September, October, November, December is spring, and, you know, the winter is, is summer, and then you go into fall. And I'm used to it now, but at first, that was that was a biggie to get used to. And so. what, what motivated you to, to buy the well, board ticket? Um, the price of it was, at that time, $3,500, and... Uh, and when you looked at just a ticket to fly to Sydney, it could end up costing you more than that. Uh, on top of that, we had accounts in Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, India, uh, that we wanted to see. And 
when you added up buying separate plane tickets for all that, and the way this ticket worked is if we decided tonight we wanted to go and there were seats uh, because they had partners with all, even though it was through British Airways, we were on all different brands of, yeah. of planes. Um, and also, uh, like I said before, that was business class, which is almost the same as first class. Yeah. So you're not stuck in there uh, like a, a cattle, you know. <laughs> so this round the world trip, is it in one go? <laughs> and how long would that take? To do? Uh, we were gone, I think about six weeks on this one. Uh, okay. it, it, you can go at your own speed. And I would uh, he would do installs, and as he would get done, and then we saw we needed to move on, like after Australia, we went to Japan, okay? And uh, so we had Japan, which Japan at that time, my first trip there was remarkable. It was so modern. Um, you get the airport from Tokyo is way outside of Tokyo, and you get on a train that, you know, the high-speed hover-like trains, and you're going like 200 miles an hour on a train. It's unbelievable um, when you go to the countries and how modern they are compared to here. And um, Tokyo, the police don't carry guns at that time. And, you know, we've had this big mask problem, I'll put it that way. I think it's a lot of people who really need their their babies, just to be honest with you. Um, people in Tokyo and Asia have commonly worn masks and were wearing masks my first trip there in 2000. And they do that because it, it stops disease, it stops the flu, it stops all the problems you have. And they don't sit around and go, oh, the government made me do it, or they this made me do it. They do it because they respect each other. And uh, I, I remember thinking, oh, that's really wild, and, and I took pictures of that, so, um, and Tokyo was, we did an install, uh, the, they really work, the Japanese work hard, they, they may live, because of the high-speed rail, they may live 150 miles from their job, or more, yeah. and commute back and forth, but uh, the distributor we were working with, um, their, their job, they're, they're in there at 5 a.m., they're working until midnight. They like to wear us out. Uh, I've never seen people work so hard in all my life. A tour there, which was really interesting on the weekend, um, where um, we went to... Um, I'm, I cannot remember the, the different uh, religious things they have there, but we went to one of the, uh, excuse me? I think Taoism is big. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we went and they showed us exactly how that worked and everything. And uh, they showed us the church. There was one Christian church in Tokyo, and it was very small. It was like, uh, I bet there was more than 100 Christians in Tokyo, uh, besides Americans that might be living there or whatever. And that was new to me. Uh, I was used to seeing, you know, countries with uh, uh, a lot of Christians and, and everything. Uh, they were very nice to us. Uh, they ate a lot of weird food. We went out to eat chicken beaks, chicken feet, uh, things of that nature. And uh, we, on that trip, and I'll move this along a little bit because I want to get to South America, but uh, we uh, went to uh, Singapore, which was remarkable. The thing about Singapore is they have very strict laws there. Chewing gum will get you 50 licks with a... Uh, a bamboo pole that's been soaked in salt water. Uh, they're very strict. Uh, the country's very clean. It's very well organized. People behave. If you do get in trouble, 
you could end up, you know, they they don't mess around. Um, and we we had a distributor there. Uh, I think the biggest thing for Singapore at that time going in was the docks of stuff from Malaysia and Indonesia that were coming through Singapore. The electronics that they were shipping to the U.S. was just astronomical at that time. It was just totally mind-boggling to, to see it. But from there, we went to Monday. Um India, and that was our first, my first trip to India, and um, let me get, uh, let's see, oh, let me go back to Japan, um, you know how it's a small, small world sometimes, mm -hmm. the tour we took on Sunday, we were out on a, a boat having lunch, and it was like a harbor tour and everything, and one of the gentlemen there said, I'm from I'm from uh, North Carolina. And I said, really, where are you from? And he goes, I'm from a little town you probably never heard of, but the TV show Mayberry was made there. <laughs> and who I was talking to, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Renfro, Renfro Mills, Socks, uh, the factories down in Mount Airy. They used to be really big down there years ago. But anyway, Robert Mills, who I was talking to, who was at that time, he owned like seven factories. And uh, so you never know who you're going to meet <laughs> yeah, uh, as you're going around. And so anyway, we went to um, Bombay. Let me get. Uh, gosh. Did you ever make it to China? Uh, no, Hong Kong. But we made us. I don't consider it being there. It was a stopover. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, see. I, I put it down because it was. I think I put it down. It was a stopover. But sometimes we. That's why I don't have notes on that because. Uh, all right, India, Mumbai, my, uh, we. It's a really interesting country because of the caste system and. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we were in a five-star hotel, and, you know, we had like a three-ring suite, and we're looking out the window across these perfectly mowed yards and everything, and I'm watching people basically bathe in sewage, you know. That's what a difference there is in how people uh, live there. Um my big thing for Mumbai was I was interested in Gandhi. Have you guys, do you know much about Gandhi? Have you studied him? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. My thing there was at the hotel, I wanted to see Gandhi's uh, library. And uh, yeah. I got a private tour and went to uh, Gandhi's library and I saw his walking stick and his white cloth, and his, what little bit he owned, his eyeglasses, that's it. For a man who freed a country of 1.7 billion people, that's all there was. But I saw his library, I spent half the day there, it was very moving for me, mm -hmm. because, yeah, I think, you know, yeah. uh, Gandhi was a man, if, if you've seen the movies about it, when they, the British wouldn't let him make salt, you know, he made salt. And uh, that was very interesting in, in itself. Uh, and then, like I said, on each continent, so we're in New Delhi, we went from Mumbai to New Delhi, uh, where the, the gate to India is. But from New Delhi, we took a, a car. You need a car, a driver, a guard and someone if you're going to go around India. It's it's uh, it's pretty wild. So we went to Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is, and went to the Taj. And uh, I have a... Uh, the Taj Mahal is just... Uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's... What can you say about it? It's moving. Uh, it's, it's on the Ganges River. It... it uh, 
it was really something to to be there. We the family who made the Taj Mahal. Uh, we bought, or I bought a, a table that uh, is made out of marble, and the Taj, if you split it down the middle, and you go 20 feet this way, or 20 feet to your right, 20 feet to your left, it's exactly the same. It's mirrored. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mirrored. It is, it is something to really see. And then we also went um, to Fort Agra, and this is where I saw something that will forever stick with me. And in the, uh, sometimes people sell their children. And these people take their kids and they make them sell crayons and books. And I guess they sell them for sex. I saw a kid who had had his hands chopped off by the guy that owned him, who was probably 11 or 12, in order to make him more pitiful so he could sell more pencils and stuff. Uh, and that just that just really it stuck with me. It hurt me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awful. You know, uh, the and then I took a picture of a gentleman at Fort Agra, and the next mm -hmm. thing I know, we've got a big problem. You don't take pictures of certain people, <laughs> Hindus. I had taken his soul, so we had to. Uh, we had to figure out how much his soul was worth, and I had to pay him enough money to cover what I had done to him. Mm -hmm. So when you're traveling in other countries, be very careful about what you do. <laughs> yeah. uh, what was the crowding situation like in India? <laughs> was it extremely overcrowded, like with yes. the news? Yeah, it's horrible. Um, you go in, in, the, in the cities, you have... Um, People who live in boxes, whole families living in boxes on the side of the sidewalk. You have uh, people who actually pay for a section of sidewalk to live on. Um, to go into the buildings to see the accounts that we had to go see, they would kind of beat people back to get us in to, to and, and then your higher up people who were who we went in to see to give a presentation to, you've got the people that go around serving the food and stuff. They act like they're not even there. They don't even work at them. It's, it's you know, it's it's a quite different different from, uh, from anything I've ever saw anyway. Yeah. And they're pretty mean to the people. Um, I wanted to get into, because I know we've gone quite a long time here. Well, you're, uh, you're perfectly all right. Um, I think before we go to South America and places like that, there was one place in Europe we wanted to touch on. Okay. And it's very prevalent in the news today, Ukraine. Have you been to Ukraine? No, just uh, we went through it. We did not okay. stop there. I have friends. Um, you saw the condo south of here and mm -hmm. um i knew a couple who uh came here from ukraine and their parents that came to visit i know quite a lot about it and everything but i haven't been there no other than um in the southern part for uh, mike went there i didn't okay. so, yeah this is something i've been meaning to ask i have two questions how did you find all this information, and this is an incredibly um, generational answer. Um, how do you find all this information without the internet? <laughs> it's called books, research, yeah. libraries. Uh, you know, uh, buying books like for Japan. I bought a book about Japan culture, how to act, everything to do. I probably had a stack of. Oh, a lot of books. I read a lot before I went of how everything works and, and all that. Uh, as far as how did I learn the information there, we hired a lot of tour guides. I see. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's with just about everywhere you go, you need, you need somebody that can show you around, usually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And 
Have you ever found yourself getting in dangerous situations in, in other countries or situations where you feel unsafe? Oh, yeah. In Spain, hold on here. In Spain and Italy, uh, the gypsies. The gypsies are all over the place, and they attack you. They will come up and try to give you a CD, a flower, something, try to make you pay them for it. Uh, I've seen people who stupidly, instead of just carrying everything, like I always kept my passport inside my chest under my under my shirt and stuff. I've seen people get their camera bags and everything ripped off. Um, so it's it can be very if, if you're if you're a stupid American tourist, as I put it, who what we did, um, we went to Goodwill and we purchased clothing. And uh, except for going into an account or something like that, we dressed down. Yeah. We dressed way down. We did not wear uh, brand name clothing, things of that nature. We wore regular Goodwill clothing, good year, Goodwill coats, all that. We made ourselves look like we didn't have a dime to our name. And that was something we read about and I would recommend anybody should do. Yeah. I had a second part to my question earlier. Obviously, the countries that you were going to, most of them, they didn't speak English in them. Did you find there to be a language barrier at all? No. The rest of the world uh, speaks two languages or three. It's only in the United States you're going to run into where most people don't speak two languages. You go to Italy, all these other countries, you say English, yes, see, it's not a problem. But uh, again, our education system is way behind the rest of the world. And as far as languages, way behind, way behind. Um, I, I, I think one of the the prettiest things I ever had was Christmas 98 in Rome. Um, the hotels always offer a breakfast that has like big pastries and cakes and cheeses and hams and all kinds of food. And I went up, went to that, and this little lady in there had a little bell, and she didn't speak English, but she did know Merry Christmas. And she rang the bell in that, in that, Italian accent, and she goes, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. And, uh, you know, she got her point across. But no, um, it's this country is where you have uh, problems with language. We never had problems. I, I can't think of any country, really. That's, that's amazing. I don't really know what I expected, but I kind of, I kind of assume that the globalization of English was a more recent event because of the internet, but I guess it doesn't necessarily. No, uh, all these other uh, countries, uh, they take English as a as a second a second language, yeah, and uh, I mean, Mike, my business partner, speaks Dutch, German. Gosh, what does he speak? He speaks like five languages. You know, and that's pretty common. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, he grew up on Dutch, and then he grew up in Montreal, so then he did French, and mm -hmm. French and English, uh, you know, and then German, because SAP is a German uh, language base, but still, so, you know, it's, it's pretty common that people from other countries know more languages. Excuse me here. Um, yeah, we, we, would, we would like to touch on Brazil some, yeah, some okay. South America. Okay. Uh, maybe Cape Town. You mentioned Cape Town. Yeah. Your list, Africa. So we want yeah, Africa. Yeah, I don't have much about that because that was basically there in business in Cape Town, the gold mine. And really didn't see anything, so I don't have anything to tell you with that. That's fine. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we want to ask about South America, so specifically Leo and um, the statue in Brazil. And uh, then we have our signature questions that I'm sure you're familiar with. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, why, don't we, why don't we start out with this? Um, first of all, 
we did uh, a 47 day trip uh, until we, we we had a, a copper mine for uh, uh, business down there and uh, Chile is, is a very unique country it's very long uh, it people really uh, it has so much uh, from the northern part uh, Valparaiso, uh, Port Monte. Um, Port Monte is a beautiful area, lakes area with seven volcanoes. Some of the volcanoes go off. Uh, they were telling us, well, every now and then, you know, the volcanoes go off and you have rocks about the size of Volkswagen buses. You have to just run and make sure they don't hit you. Uh, you've got Patagonia uh, in the southern yeah, shore. One of okay. the most in the world. Yeah, and we we sailed the Straits of Magellan. We sailed Darwin Channel uh, for days, just looking at uh, you know the ice, uh, the uh, Patagonia, uh, Cape Horn, uh, the bottom of South America. We sailed around that one morning at 4 a.m. And that is, that's a very dangerous passage. It's called Drake's Passage. And that's where the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean come together. And it can be mean. Uh, we got through it not all that bad. Um, but it, it it's something. Uh, we started on one trip where we went to Ecuador first. And um, the Panama hat was invented in Ecuador, not Panama, which I found to be very interesting. Um, Ecuador wasn't really anything else. The next country, Peru. Peru is something. That is a country I would suggest if you guys can ever go to South America is go to Cusco, go to Machu Picchu, um, you know. Uh, we were on a, a ship uh, that was going around South America, and we got off in Peru and Pisco, and we flew to Cusco, which was going from sea level to 14,000 feet. Now, the way you handle that is in Peru, cocoa leaves are legal, that they make cocaine from. Yes, yeah. 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 Chew cocoa leaves. So you get to the hotel and they hand you a big bag of cocoa leaves and you chew them. And I chewed away and my partner didn't and he ended up sick in bed with altitude sickness while I was able to look around. You know, uh, we could not take them back on the boat though. They are illegal. Uh, we went to Machu Picchu. Uh, that was... That's a fabulous trip. If you can ever, ever make it there, and the rock, the the whole area of Cusco, it's not just Machu Picchu. The rocks are laid together without concrete, without anything to stick together with them. Um, the it was a thousand years ago. How they ever found that mountain top? That is at the headwaters of the Amazon River, too. I don't know if you knew that or not. That's how far you have been there. It was interesting for us in that um, the ship offered a trip to Machu Picchu, and it was very expensive, and so most of us did our own. And we were scared about getting back, and we got to the airport in Cusco, and Peru, some of these countries can really be funny. Uh, they had a problem. It seems that the pilot and everybody on the plane that was supposed to fly us back to the ship, their license ran out the day before, and they had to find the pilot <laughs> to fly us back to the ship, <laughs> which was quite... Um, uh, yeah, that was quite a, a, a runaround because we had to get back to Lima or the ship would leave us. Uh, so... Machu Picchu, though, uh, I, I'm sure you've seen pictures of it. Um, yeah, I, it, it is supposed to be a place that uh, it's a UNESCO uh, site. 
you ride a train up in the morning uh, from Cusco up to the valley, and uh, then you go up to Machu Picchu, and uh, it's unbelievable that, that they even had bathrooms and stuff in there a thousand years ago yeah. with running water and showers. Yeah. And, uh, you mentioned in your list you visited the Falkland Islands. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Okay, the Falkland Islands are a place that I could never live. <laughs> they're, they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're pretty rough. They're, uh, they're England as the country that claims them. Uh, we went there and we rode about 12 miles through what I would call a bog, bogs. I guess bogs is a good way to put it. It was kind of like a field of uh, swamp, but not swampy. And when we finally got to where we were going, there were over 10,000 penguins. Wow. Uh, king penguins and gentle penguins. And we spent the day there. The penguins came up to you. They had no fear of you. It was remarkable. Um, it, I don't know how to put it. It's one of those days that you feel so blessed. You're there. And, you think in God that you have made it to this place. You know, I'm spiritual. I am not a church person at all. But I think God puts you in certain places. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of how I see things. I'm, I'm not a Bible beater person like that. But uh, I've always in my life, I've always had food to eat. I've always had a place to sleep. Never had any problems like that, and I I have ran into people um, who are famous just all the time by accident. Um, that's a whole other story. But um, the Machu Picchu trip and uh, oh, the main food of Peru they have a special food you guys would probably love. It's deep fried guinea pig. <laughs> Yeah, oh, come really on. I, do you think I tried that? No, I don't know. I looked at it. <laughs> I looked at it. I'm, I'm not that brave, guys. It, they take a whole guinea pig and they bread it up and deep fry that sucker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Um, I think the, the worst thing that happened to me in Chile, I, I mentioned to you guys before. Did you look up Pinochet after I mentioned him? Or you guys? Yes, I did. You did? What did you think about him? Monster. Yeah. Put it lightly. How, put it. how would you feel if you were on the tour and uh, you, the tour guide is telling you all this stuff, and then Pinochet comes up, and I said to her, he was an SOB. Now, I'm in her country. She looks at me, and she goes, he did a lot of good things for our country, sir. I almost fell over. And then she went on to tell me that those things, the bad things that he did, his wife made him do them. Okay? Um, that is the closest I've come to fascism. Mm -hmm. And it's fascism head on. It's what's hitting hit this country. And I hope you guys read. 200,000 people disappeared. Around Chile, there were black cutouts of people who disappeared. You know? It's bad enough that he tortured these people. He rounded them up and he put them in, in, in the uh, stadium there in San Diego and stuff. He tortured them. And then he put them in helicopters and airplanes, handcuffed, alive in a lake, threw them out over the ocean, and pushed them in the water. 
And I've got a tour guide standing there telling me what a good man he was. Um, that was a day to remember. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I think I her father, I think her father was in the military under him mm. because of her age. And I think her father was probably one of the people who did the torturing and stuff. That's yeah. about all I could come up with. Uh, but that was that was uh, uh, that was a between the eye hit for me. I just I could not believe. I'm glad you guys looked that up. Uh, Ushua, Argentina, uh, Falkland mm. Islands. We'll go back to the Falkland Islands. Argentina and Falkland Islands are still at war. Okay, uh, England. It, it's it's ridiculous. The Falkland Islands has to get everything from England, which is about 9,000 miles away. They can't go through Argentina. And Ushua is the most southernmost city in the world. And the thing that scared me the most about, we were down in, this is 16, 2016, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and down near uh, Antarctica. And Ushua, the ski, because of, of global warming, the, uh, where they used to get snow for skiing, they no longer got snow for it. They had only getting snow at the very top of the mountain. And I, I, I've seen stuff with global warming that would really scare, scare you bad uh, yeah. down around Antarctica and in that part of in Patagonia. Um, you know, the ice that's melting. Uh, it's, it's just how people can say nothing's happening. And I understand they haven't had the chance I've had to go down and see the, the what's going on. I get that. But yeah. still, you know, uh, it's... Oh, the other thing on the Falkland Islands is they eat penguin eggs. Really? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, they eat a lot of meat, too. They can't grow many vegetables, so they have a lot of sheep and cattle. They're big on meat. They fish? Huh? Fish, yeah. Do they, fish. Is there any fish in industry? Not really an industry. The Falkland Islands is owned by about 13 rich British people, kind of like England is. You have, like, you know, your... Your people who are wealthy, and it's split into 13 sections. And uh, everybody, that there's 3,500 people that live on the Falkland Islands, and they work for the wealthy people that live there. I guess that's the best way to put it. Okay. Um, um, and, uh, one more thing you mentioned in South America that was really interesting was the Statue of Christ. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and if you saw my um, Facebook page, did you see mm -hmm. my face? Well, I'm, I'm up there and I'm videotaping and the cloud clears around Christ. Did you see that video I, I made? Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, it's public, so yeah, I'm pretty sure you can see it. Uh, yeah, the Statue of Christ, we went there to see that and... Uh, it it's remarkable. Uh, it's fallen down a lot, but uh, I we went up there. Uh, you have to take a, a steep train to get to the top of that, and I believe it was built in the 1920s. I can't remember that right offhand. I'm starting to get a little bit bad on that, but. Uh, it was a, it's also a very moving place to go. We also toured a fabula there, which is mm -hmm. like a very dangerous. We went into the one that uh, the police wouldn't even go into. And we oh, went yeah, there yeah, five yeah. hours. Uh, that was something yeah, we. I've seen a few videos about part, different areas in Brazil that are just notoriously dangerous and it's yeah. scary. Yeah, uh, but. In life, if you don't go look around and put your neck out a little bit, you won't get to see everything that's going on. Well, that's my thinking. 
Uh, you have to sometimes take a little bit of risk here and there, or you won't see everything. We did an Amazon uh, 30 days up the Amazon River, and uh, we in one area we stopped. We got to hold sloths. There's pink dolphins up there, and for five bucks we were paying. This was funny. We we're paying this guy to get on a little bitty canoe. And I didn't have any clue where we were going. We just took off up the Amazon, and then we turned up a little side tributary thing. <laughs> and we go up, and he points. We're going to go up the hill. We get up the hill, and uh, we see these shacks with, um, you know, hardly, no windows or anything. Nobody's got any clothes on at all. Okay. Uh, so we, we, the little kids wanted to hold hands, and they were, everybody was very friendly, and he showed us around, and we looked at everything, and then we came back down. Um, also, on the river, a lot of the houses are made to float on the Amazon River because of the flooding they have. You know, they flood up to 80 feet. It will go up to 80 feet during wet season. Um, now, it is remarkable to go up the Amazon because you're on the equator. And every day is 12 hours dark, 12 hours light. Um, you're at the split of... It, it's a very interesting trip to make if you ever get a chance to do it. Uh, if I were going to do it again instead of doing it by boat, I think I would go into Peru... Uh, Colombia and the um, the northern part of Brazil and Menos. Um, you know all these little uh, motorcycles, crotch rockets. Yeah. yeah. Menos is where they make them at. Menos is the manufacturing hub of crotch rockets, as we call them, like that, and everything. So, Mr. Barr, um, we've had a great time talking to you this season. I think we could talk to you for hours. Four hours. Yeah. Sadly, the software that we use only allows for two hours. After two hours, it cuts off. So, uh, we'd like to fit in a couple of questions uh, so okay. that we can have a nice, clean transition to the end of the interview. All right. Um, so, I'll start first. Um, what advice do you have for young adults just making their way in the world? They don't really know what they want to do yet. They don't know what they want to do yet. They're, they're just trying to make their way. Go and do something that makes you happy. Even if it doesn't pay the most money or it doesn't, uh, everybody else says, oh, you shouldn't do that. Because in Carroll County, there is a negative attitude of, oh, you don't want to do that. Yes, you do want to do that. And what I would say to a lot of people is, if it makes you happy, do it. Try it. If it doesn't work out, then take the next road. Remember Robert Frost? The road not taken? Because at my age now, I've got a disease that's taken me down pretty fast. And there's a lot of roads I wish I could have taken that I'm not going to be able to. And at your age, I would say... Don't worry about how much money it's going to pay. Don't worry about all that. What makes you happy? Yes, sir. And uh, our second our, question, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. You've listened to our interviews before, and we always get really unique. And Yes, it's uh, it's kind of a doozy, but uh, it's, it's a pretty special question. I mean, I'll let Ethan ask yeah. that. And what is the meaning of life to you? Personally. Personally, the meaning of life... To do for others, to give of yourself and do what you can for others. If if your brother needs help, help him. If if I've never missed a meal, and I've given and given and given to other people, and I think the biggest thing, the biggest happiness I've come is to do for others. Give your time to others. It doesn't have to be money. It can just be your time. And, but do for others. Do for the elderly. Do for the sick. Do for children. Take time. 
but especially in your generation, the more you do for others, and secondly, forgive. Forgive. If anyone crosses you or whatever, remember, we're not perfect, and there's, we need to forgive and try to move on. Uh, because you don't know when your life is going to be over. And uh, I think the meaning of life to me is that the God or whoever that made us is that we need to work and do for others, which I'm not seeing right now in this world. Well, Mr. Barr, it was an honor to speak to you this evening. It's extremely interesting, and uh, we both thank you for coming on. All right. Well, I enjoyed it. And if you need any more, I know you ran out of time. If you need any more notes or anything, uh, just write me or let me know, okay?